Well, greetings. I wish I could speak Mari now. I apologize. I was debating whether I would try, but um, it's my delight to be here. You don't, it's, it's, it's no chore whatsoever. It's an absolute privilege to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I see many faces that I've known over a lot of years, um, and it's just so fantastic to see what you have accomplished um, over this period of time when I first came here. Um, really celebrating you all um, for all the work that you've done and um, reaching so many families, your commitment to them. It's a long-term, persistent, uh, relentless commitment, um, especially when I know I've been seeing people since probably 16 years ago when I started coming here. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. You will never have to twist my arm to come here. <laughs> In fact, the last thing my husband said before I left, he said, do you think we should move to New Zealand? <laughs> At this point, I tell you I'm Canadian. <laughs> Getting more Canadian all the time. And <laughs> maybe become New Zealander, but... Uh, um, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, I wanted to introduce one of my um, friends to begin with. Are you nervous? Uh, I'm a little nervous. Um, I wanted to come today because something has happened to me. Somebody tailored me. <laughs> what happened? Do you know Tanya? I didn't used to have dimples. Uh, Carolyn said I could talk about one of my problems today and you would help me. I did tell you that, but actually you're supposed to talk about that this afternoon. Oh, I have trouble waiting sometimes. Do you think you can wait to this afternoon? Well, I'll try. Um, but you see, I just wanted to make sure that you still know who I am, you know. I'm Freddie Feelings, but somebody gave me a new name. Mitchell. <laughs> I don't know, am I also got a new name and a new body and a new look? Wow. Well, I hope you'll help me find my identity. Maybe I've just become a New Zealander. <laughs> okay, thank you. You get to talk to them this afternoon again. All right, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. I have, I'm going to show you quite a few videos today because I'm going to introduce you to a new program that you don't have in New Zealand, so hopefully I'm going to entice you into something different. Um, just going back, uh, and that program is called the Incredible Years uh, Beginnings Program. Um, just to, to go over where you are here um, in terms of the, the different programs that you've used, um, the, the preschool program is the one that's the most widely used, as I understand it. Um, and then we're going to spend, uh, sometimes there are some places doing the advanced program. Um, we're going to spend some time this morning talking about the Incredible Beginnings program. Uh, you've already been using the teacher program for some time. This is Incredible Beginnings is another teacher daycare provider program. And then the last, first three days of this week, I was training in the teacher autism program. So you can see the different uh, programs that are on board here. And I put together, let's see if that works. Yeah. Um, I went back historically to see when it started. Um, and it seems to me that the first time I have a record of it anyway is was 2004 when you began with the basic parenting program. Some of you might tell me I, you started earlier than that. What? Pardon? It was the first training. In total. The very first training. Okay, all of those people who were in the first training, can you put up your hands? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow, you get the persistence coaching. <laughs> Yeah, so we're looking at six, about 16 years ago. Um, that was followed by the teacher uh, management training uh, in 2009. Those who were trained in the teacher program, can you put up your hands? Mm, we've got about over 20 of those ones. Fantastic. 
then later, what comes next was the autism program for parents. And those people who have been trained in that program, can you put up your hands? Wow, awesome. Some of you were just trained this week by Peter. Uh, at the same time was the autism program for teachers. Can you put up your hands if you're one of those? Wow, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere around 20 or so. You probably have these figures somewhere. Okay, what's next? Hmm. Toddler, toddler, I found out about started actually in 2018, but I didn't really know about it till we, we I, I think probably in preparation for coming here that there was an effort to really bring that program forward. Occasionally there's a few places doing these programs, but that the, the actual ministry um, have engaged in bringing the toddler program forward. I'm so excited about that. You see what hap what's happening here in terms of the, the development of the programs is we're beginning to get to reach families at a younger age. And it was my, was my hope from the get-go that we would be able to do that because I think the earlier, the better. Um, so I'm just delighted. I spent yesterday doing consultation with those people who are delivering the toddler program. Uh, and that's, that's very exciting to see, and I'm delighted that you're doing a evaluation of that program. Okay, you're not done yet. <laughs> what happens next will be the Incredible Beginnings program, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And that's bringing the program down to daycare providers. I'm not quite sure what you call them here. Those people who care for children ages one and up. Okay, so it's really an adaptation, we'll talk about this later, of TC, what I call TCM, but I understand here you call it IYT. <laughs> I'm trying to get all the lettering right here. And guess what? What happens after that? Hmm? Husbands! Husbands! Oh! <laughs> you have to... If you want to do husbands and partners, you have to go to the advanced program. <laughs> and actually, I was asking someone the other day why um, New Zealand hadn't really taken up the advanced program, particularly if you're working with high-risk families and child welfare referred families, and, and that's the program. Actually, in every single uh, study that we have done, we've had basic plus advanced for those families. Um, so that would be interesting to talk about that. Um, for your higher risk families, it's, you know, need some assistance with managing depression and anger and building support systems and knowing how to problem solve. Because after all, if you are, uh, you, you maybe improved your parenting skills, but if you're still yelling at your partner, what's being bought, modeled, right? Okay, the last one I have there is the baby program. And that came up in the toddler group yesterday of these, the, the videos that were presented of were families that had been referred for child neglect and abuse. And I'm thinking, hmm, wouldn't it be nice if we got to them earlier than we're getting to them now? So the t teacher classroom management program, you know, all of those who've done teacher classroom management training, can you put up your hand so I can see? Wow. It's looking like almost 90% of the group. That is fabulous, fabulous. Uh, do you know that you're the best in the world in delivering this? <laughs> I'm gonna show you some pie charts at the end of my talk uh, about where you are relative to other countries and which programs you've taken on board compared with some other countries. So why did we do that? These figures are US figures, but I don't think they're too different from yours. At least in our country, um, in the United States, about 46% of kindergarten teachers say that half their students lack the emotional and self-regulatory and social skills to function in, in kindergarten. I haven't seen the New Zealand figures, so it would be kind of nice to have those, if I can get those sometime. Or how different are they from us? Um, our children that are in what we call Head Start, but these are our preschools for high-risk families that live in or economically disadvantaged, about 16 to 30% of them 
have aggressive behavior. Teachers report that handling the misbehavior is their greatest challenge and the one in which they say they are the least prepared for. So you're right on the mark in terms of the effort that you're making. And lastly, I think that teachers and school personnel have such a unique opportunity to help children who have been neglected or maltreated and to strengthen families. So oftentimes I find when um, different countries go after this problem, they go directly to the parents. But actually, you know, the teacher is like a second parent. It really is. Sometimes children spend more time with that daycare provider than they do with their own parents. So they can make a huge difference in the outcome for those children, enhancing the resiliency of these uh, children who've been neglected or abused. So you all know this because there's so many of you here who look like almost 85 or 90% of the group, so I don't need to go through it. You all know that it was a six-day workshop program sped out monthly or bi-monthly. And you all know that the IY principles uh, or processes and methods that we focus on are to be collaborative, self promote self-reflection on the part of the teachers, the group problem-solving, um, we, we use modeling a lot, both video modeling and live modeling. Always talking about goals for the target child and planning. Lots of practice, the more practice, the better. If you've been, re if you've been reviewed by me or Jamila, you know we're always probably telling you we could do some more practices here. Get it out of the cognitive realm and into the behavioral realm. And what I love about what you're doing here is the coaching that you're doing between your workshops. Um, I would say you're exceptional in that way. I, I rarely see that happening. People, a lot of times governments are thinking that the workshop itself does it, doesn't. The coaching between workshops makes all the difference in really bringing the behaviors forward. And what we're talking about today and some more this afternoon is how we tailor our training to think about the unique characteristics, in this case, of either the child in terms of the cognitive development, the language development, or the play development of the child, to be developmentally appropriate and helping teachers and parents know how to do that. And that's really the emphasis of, of the program. So in terms of research, um, I only know of one randomized trial doing it with teachers of children diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, which I did. And we were combining teacher with parent training and child training and looking at the different components. You know, was it necessary to add teacher training to parent training? Am I making sense? So I looked at each one alone, parent only, parent plus teacher, child only, parent plus teacher plus child, and control conditions to see. And what we did find that we had more sustainable results across settings from home to school where we had teacher training in addition to parent training. So there again, New Zealand is ahead of the game, ahead of the ball. You're doing both. And I love that, that both you can have both parents who are in the incredible program, parent program, and teachers, and they're all, they're proud of the fact that they are incredible parents and teachers. Um, it does make a difference. Um, we've done a number of randomized control trials ourselves um, in high-risk schools um, to see what outcomes we get there is considered more indicated prevention rather than treatment. Uh, and there have been at least seven independent randomized control trials in places like Norway, England, Portugal, Ireland, and the U.S. Um, and we have findings in terms of reduced childhood aggression in the classroom, increased social-emotional competence, increases in school success, and increases in parent involvement. These studies you can find on the website. Uh, in the library section, just put in the word teacher and you'll see a lot of studies. What's important is they are randomized control trials. I'm still working on New Zealand to think about this, but um, 
It is looking at what happened compared to children who did not get the intervention, what outcomes we got um, that were significantly greater than usual services. The latest one was just this year, 2020, that came out of the United States showing that compared to the control children, those who had TCM, which you call I am, IYT, um, had enhanced mathematics scores compared to the control group, which totally blew me away. So we're seeing academic outcomes. The teacher said they had so much more, they, and this was in primary schools, uh, they had managed the behavior so much better, they could do more teaching, and the kids were learning more. Um, and that paper um, is in the library, it just came out in January. Um, I think that might help us in terms of trying to convince why money should be spent on this, um, that it's enhancing not just social and emotional, which I think is the foundation for absolutely everything in terms of learning, but it's enhancing the academic outcomes as well. So these I won't, these were just studies showing you those that were done. Actually, the one that um, I just talked about is the one that's 2020, the second one. But I will tell you, if you put the word teacher in the library, it'll, it'll jump out at you. Um, United Kingdom has had a couple of randomized control trials, as has Norway. Um, the results are similar across countries across different cultural backgrounds. Okay, here's the big news. According to our records, you have 959 uh, group leaders who have been trained in TCM, almost 1,000. So what I don't have, which was what Sue was presenting earlier, was the number of children that you reached. But you can imagine one teacher um, you know, can impact a lot of children in terms of training them, and not just one year, but years afterwards. So it'd be great to have someone kind of look at the actual numbers of children overall you train, because it's, it's good value for the buck in the sense of you change them maybe helping that classroom, but then the classroom's thereafter. What have we learned about young children's brain development? Um, certainly we know that lot in the last 25, 30 years is that children's brain and neuron connections in the early years are still under construction. They are not born fully formed. And it really is that the architecture of the brain, and this is kind of how I explain it to the, the parents, is being stimulated and sculpted by the quality of their interactions and their experiences, <coughs> um, whether it's with teachers or with, with parents. So it is that the effects of the neglect and the poor stimulation and the poverty on children's brains is profound. And this is the difference between seeing a normal-sized brain scan versus on the other side, what happened to the brain where there was neglect. It's huge. And most of us know now from the research that a lot of the disadvantaged families, or children rather, um, living in poverty, don't get much language in their homes, and when they get to school to start primary school, they're already behind. Um, so we, we really are recognizing more the importance of starting earlier. So early intervention with these families really can capitalize on the neuroplasticity of the brain in early life. With those connections we want to strengthen, Here's my little dendrites, synapse in between. We want to strengthen with lots of repetition, lots of promoting those connections of language, for example, versus which connections we want to prune away. So we certainly don't want to encourage and strengthen aggressive behavior, for example. Um, so it is um, this period of time that we can make a profound difference in a child's outcome. Um, the last point there is supporting the child-teacher-parent relationship, I think, really enhances the resiliency of children that unfortunately come from disadvantaged uh, home situations. 
Okay, the incredible years, um, incredible beginnings, rather me, program um, is for children ages one to five. Uh, one of the things we do in this program is really talk a lot about brain development and the different things that you can do. Those are all little neurons there that you're seeing. Things such as daily reading time, um, uh, mirroring what the child is doing, initiating, helping the child initiate interactions with others, limited screen time, these sorts of things. I mean, that's huge, right? And helping parents or teachers, usually it's parents, but understand the problem with putting their baby or their toddler on their iPad all day. And unfortunately, the most disadvantaged kids spend the most amount of time on screen time. It's huge. Um, it is kind of a cheap babysitter, but um, it's a big problem. Um, we really work on this um, in the program. How is the Incredible Beginnings program different from the teacher classroom management program? You, have, you will have new vignettes um, and a training protocol, and there's a specific protocol for training for one to two years, which we call tweenies. So there's a tweenie training protocol and separate DVDs for that versus um, the, the three to five age range. And, and there are new vignettes there to help the teachers know how to manage children with developmental delays or language delays or some children who may be on the spectrum. So we, I now consider that to be part of a regular teacher training because they get such, you know, in those early years, you get such a wide variation in development. Um, so those are new vignettes. Actually, some of the vignettes, for those who've done the autism training, some of the teacher autism vignettes, a uh, few of them are included in Incredible Beginnings as well. Lots more, for example, toddlers will be focusing on um, separation anxiety and how to manage that, how to help the children have a secure bond with their daycare provider or their childcare provider. Um, Strategies for promoting language that include visuals, that include the use of nonverbal signals, the use of their body language, if you will, their gestures, their songs, the importance of imitation, repetition, uh, emphasis on promoting and prompting um, the behaviors we want to see, as well as the interactive reading, which we start with the babies. but. Um, beginning self-regulation skills. There's more emphasis on pretend play and the use of puppets and the focusing on the ABCs. So often I think in the basic parenting program and the TCM program we talk about, we have the behavior, what's the consequence, right? With these children, we're talking more about what's the antecedent, what's the motivator first? You know, if I have these bubbles here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prompt my child to say bubble Please. I'm going to prompt a word. So how we really enhance the use of the antecedent um, to bring about or prompt the behavior that we want to see. And then the consequences, of course, they get the bubbles. Um, so topics for incredible beginnings will look a little bit familiar to you, to TCM. So it's sort of like TCM extended in terms of... Um, the topics, although much more on building the um, positive relationships around children who are really distressed in daycare and crying and separation anxiety and difficulties like that. A lot of emphasis on language development, um, different coaching, but how do you do that? How do you do that social coaching or that emotion coaching with a young child and how it differs? I'll try to show you some examples of that. Reducing teacher stress is a theme throughout and building their support networks. So as I said, there's a protocol for tweenies, toddlers, and preschoolers separately. Um, it is like TCM in that it's one, six one-day workshops. But if you are going to combine tweenies and toddlers with preschool teachers all in the same group, it will take you seven workshops to get through it. If you separate it out in terms of the protocols and do only tweenies or toddlers together in one group, 
and preschoolers and another. You can do each one for six days. That makes sense? Because of the emphasis, clearly with tweenies and toddlers, we're not talking about some of the discipline strategies that you might use with the older kids. And with the older kids, we're not doing so much depth around separation anxiety. So there's a, you know. Um, okay. I'm going to show you a video now about a teacher reflections. Um, so this is just to give you the idea with some of these videos is that I want you to just see examples of what they look like. Um, this program has quite a bit on like the autism programs, more on uh, also showing not only the skill set, but the teacher, the reflections of the teachers of what they're doing which we haven't seen in BASIC or 2CM. And the, uh, the idea there is it seems to be very valuable to the teachers and parents to see other parents or other teachers talking about using these strategies. It used to be that I would bring in former graduates from the program to come and talk. But that, that's really hard and really expensive. And this way, I, I was hoping that having them on the video, you, that, would, that would help with that. This is up here. You can see what's in the first program, how we're talking about um, bringing, dropping kids off at daycare, separation anxiety, helping them feel secure, what happens and how we fade out the parents when the, when the child is really upset. Um, but I'm going to go. And then the second, just so you can see the whole menu, you can see there's 20 vignettes on this subject. <laughs> That's why it takes longer if, if you're doing the, the younger program and begin to see um, how to help the toddlers feel safe and secure in that setting. So we'll go to just this teacher reflections piece, talking about building relationships. Oh. Yay! You put it in. I'm a teacher for young children with and without disabilities, and by young children right now, this class is called a tweenies class, and that is in between infants and toddlers. We have a pig. This is their first experience in any kind of playgroup setting. What? Look at how big a point. Whoa, put them in, come help back. Zip. Zap. This is their first time without a parent or a caregiver of some kind. Oh, you do zip zap. Zip. Zap. We try to first establish a relationship with the kids. That's our main objective. Mom will be back. Yeah. I'll see you after circle, okay? Bye-bye. Say bye. I'll pause it there for a minute. In this program, you'll see each of those um, children with different situations. This little baby here is 14 months, doesn't walk yet, and we think he's on the spectrum. Um, this boy here has a lot of difficulty separating from his parents and you'll see when you're showing the vignettes how we help the parent, how we help the, the, the child um, deal with that. And some of them are, have more difficulties than others. Some it takes a few minutes and others cry for the next two hours, right? So we try to show the variation depending on what kind of a child you have, how we deal with it, how we talk to the parents about how they leave, how they separate how we give them feedback, that sort of thing. I really like the families to say goodbye. It's harder in the beginning. Bye bye, Mama. They know the family's leaving, they're sad right away. Bye bye, Mama. But in the long run, it's better. Do you want to fix it? We really try to build a sense of community in our classrooms, even with the little, little kids. And she's been doing better. She's been letting us, you know, interact with her and you know, she always does. If it does happen that a kid is not able to do anything but cry, quite often we'll have the family, a family member come and stay. And what we like to do is kind of a fade out process. And actually, you know what you can do is if you, like when the other kids move, move back a little bit, just to see if she'll, that's kind of what we were talking with Kimberly about, is like kind of moving back a little bit. We encourage the mom and dad or the caregiver to play with the child, but also play with other kids. That's great. Staying, you know, just kind of doing a little bit more. We should probably go after you, but that's okay. Just pause there for a minute. So 
this is a reflection, but earlier that you would have shown these vignettes without the teacher talking about it and problem solved in the same way that you do the other programs, like how would you handle this? What would you do next? What, how would you talk to the parent? Um, here's a practice where the parent's trying to remove herself a little bit, um, and they're doing what we call the fading out process um, here. So all the methods and processes are the same. Um, as what you're used to, so you know you will know how to deliver um, in that sense. Well, it's different content, but hey, you want to put something in? And we try to build like a little try it. I'll come over and sit next to the to the little kiddo who's sad and try to do some interacting, or I'll interact with mom or grandma or nanny, or you know, so that they can see that oh, this person's okay, this person's safe. And once you, she realizes you're not going to leave, she'll be better about it, I think. Look, Grandma's going to stay away. Yay! I think with Nora, you know, if it comes to be that she's comfortable and she's playing without Grandma right next to her or sitting right by her, then I think we would figure out. We'll have parents say, hey, my kid cried for a month. All kids go through it. Kids with and without disabilities. They're doing something that's typical, it's hard on everybody, the time's happy, but in the long run, it's a healthy developmental stage. Uh-oh, he went in, you do. Okay, so that gives you an example of a reflection and how we use that. Okay, so I'm going to just show you a debriefing. So now, um, at the moment, I'm going to ask you to think of yourself as a group leader for a minute and watch this and just think to yourself, um, obviously we don't have enough time and we have so many people I can't do as much interaction and it's always hard because I don't like to do trainings where I'm just speaking, but um, do the reflection to yourself thinking about what this teacher or daycare provider is doing um, with this mother and what, what is effective about it. Okay, does that make sense? One of the mothers in the classroom was worried about her son's separation anxiety. As a result, the mother was gradually fading out her presence in the classroom by mostly observing and not directly playing with her child. Where, oh, where is our friend Cal? The teachers worked hard to engage this boy with play activities. At the end of the day, the teacher and mother debrief on how this day went. Think about the importance of this check-in. So Cal had a great day? Yeah, he did. He's doing a little better every day. Oh my I gosh. Like. Today yeah. he barely checked in with mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and he didn't need his lovey till nope. almost oh, first day. And you know what? Kids get tired too. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something we need to remember. He's doing a lot of playing. Yeah. And he's running, and like you said, he's feeling really comfortable. Yeah. I know. He's so we get to see the tree Yeah. I like it. I know. We like it, don't we? If I compare to the first <laughs> how upset he would get. Yeah. You cry almost the whole time. Yeah. And now you didn't cry at all. No. Yeah. So I think when we do, when I do leave, uh -huh. I mean, he's, he might cry a little, yeah. but I think it'll be so short lived. Yeah, I think you're right. And you've done such a good job of kind of fading yourself back a little bit and sitting down, playing with the other kids, which is, he sees that. Yeah. And he's like, still checking in. And, but he, today, I think he yeah. checked in like just a couple just times. Just a couple right? times. Yeah. He's uh -huh. busy kissing girls. I know. Just splashing water. Kind of so. love the relationship. Did you kiss Leighton? Is she your friend? Yeah. Oh, he doesn't want to talk about it. No, that's embarrassing. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah, I thought he did really well. And just, you know, whenever we're ready to kind of take the next yeah. step, you just yeah. let me know. Okay. I mean, however, you know, <laughs> just can play it by ear, but, um, yeah, he's got it figured out. Mm -hmm. yeah. He does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And remember, you can talk about it when you're home, too. We do. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we Perfect. talk about a lot how mommy always comes back and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, um, Jimmy's there. We always remind you that Jimmy's there. Yes, we talk perfect. about all the teachers and we sing the songs. Great, perfect. Those so are all the best things to do. Yeah. Doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you think so? Yeah. But you're doing a great job, and thanks so much for being so supportive. Oh sure, of course. I love it. And you know, the most important thing is for us to build a relationship with him, which I think you know now he comes to us and plays. Yeah. He's silly and mm -hmm. comfortable, which is perfect. That's what yeah, we want. I think he's feeling safe here for sure. Great. Yeah. Great. Huh. Oh. This is a fun place. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. 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 You're just silly now. Uh -huh. You and you. So that's our goal, isn't it? 
it's a safe place, and the parents think it's a safe place, and the, t the child thinks it's a safe place. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to, to talk to the person on your right, I guess, um, and just think about one thing that struck you that you liked that this daycare <laughs> provider did. For any of you, does it bring back memories of when you first dropped your child off at some kind of a daycare? <laughs> Couldn't be more. I remember walking away crying. Um, yeah, we don't have time to take the feedback, but if there's some gem that you got from that and you want to write it down on your gem seat, you can do that. Um, but it will evoke a lot when you're talking about this um, and getting the ideas from the teachers of how they handle it. This case, she's debriefing on what was a successful day, but you might set up a role play for that or a practice, how you give feedback to the parent. Do you tell them that their baby, their toddler cried for six hours <laughs> um, or not? So you'll go through the process of how you do that. You'll also do a practice of how they tell the parents how they want to handle it when they leave their child how long they're going to stay, what they're going to do. And it'll, of course, be very variable for every child, depending on how they manage that situation. So you can see how you can bring in these practices. It's making sense to you? OK. So the next one we're going to look at is um, using descriptive commenting. Um, and what I want you to think about here is what makes this teacher's approach effective? How is she helping? These are tweenies now. How is she helping these tweenies learn language? Okay, and there will be a little bit of intro at the beginning, but uh, I've done this right. Let's see. Zoom. Oops. Zoom. It's not going big. Tell me what I'm doing wrong here. Maybe it's there? No. One more oh, approaching called descriptive commenting is a type of language that teachers and parents can use with toddlers. Helen found a bumpy ball in the barrel. This involves words spoken slowly in a high-pitched, exaggerated, playful voice with positive enthusiasm, repetition, lots of oohs and ahs, and nonverbal hand gestures. <laughs> Purple frog. It is really a running commentary on toddlers' activities that often sounds like a simplified version of a sports announcer's play-by-play -play description <laughs> of what the children are doing and seeing. Whoa, boom. Uh -oh. Young children not only love this kind of positive attention, but it really works to expand their language skills. What happened? In the so pausing there, that's the narration part. So you're all familiar with using descriptive commenting and narrating play because you're doing it with the teacher program and the parent program. But how's that different with a toddler or a tweenie? That's what we're going to be looking at. It's not the same. If you just ream a lot of language, it'll be like a lot of babble babble. <coughs> So look at what she, this teacher does here. And this is during a, a snack time. And think about how it's different, how she's developmentally, she's making it developmentally appropriate for the age of these tweenies. Svenja, watch the way this teacher uses this teacherese language during snack time. Do you want some water? Yeah, more water. Lord, water. 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 Cool cup, your cool cup, Nora. What are you doing there, Miss? It's all berries, your favorite. Yeah, yeah. berries. So good. All right, Miss Nora. Water. Yeah, nice hockey. Want more sticks, Abigail? Yeah. She'll be back after circle. Yeah. What? Water? You want water? Okay, I'm going to give a cup to our friend 
Matt, Teacher Bailey. Okay. Matt's got to do some drinking. Very I mean, I, I, if you, when you're showing this, you're going to pause it, so it's always really hard for me to keep going and not want to pause. But you can see that this is really a very uh, carefully choreographed sequence going on here. You know, she's one thing with the one little 14-month-old sitting next to her in terms of, you know, using her gesturing. And then she's got another boy over there who can ha who's using words asking for water, and she expands on it. So she's actually tailoring how she's speaking, what, what, how much gesturing versus words versus sounds, how many words to every single child at this table, according to what their developmental ability is to enhance their learning. Yeah? It looks easy, but it really isn't. And usually what you see is a teacher doing the same thing with everybody. Berries. Oh, do you want more berries, fella? Berries. Oh, berries. Berries. All right, here they come. Berries. Here we go. We're going to eat more berries. We have red berries. We have more berries. So that would be an example of a one-up rule for those of you in autism. Berries. He's saying berries, so she adds one red berries. So she's trying to expand his language. Of course, she wouldn't do it with the other little child next to her. That wouldn't work, right? Um, so that's that difference. Berries are awesome. Good job. She's got the object right next to the word, enhancing the understanding of the word berries. She's got the actual berries there. While there is great variability in toddlers' normal language development, you can see that these toddlers, aged 14 to 18 months, aren't expressing much language. Nora, but with Nora's nod, Max pointing, and Bella's verbal responses, yeah, berries. it is clear that they do understand what the teacher is saying and are beginning to use syllables and single words. Uh -oh, bold down. Using descriptive commenting will help enhance language skills, which are essential to further development of toddler's thinking and cognitive development. Berries are awesome. Oops, sorry. All right. Um, so there again would be um, an example, and you'd break that down and unpack it. You know, when she's using words, when she's using visuals or gestures, and then you, the normal strategy would be going to talk about the particular children they're working with and how you tailor their language for them. With a child who has no language but only sounds, um, and how you repeat the ba 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 for berries. Um, and you'd think about what these children learned here, what language was being um, accented here with the teacher's approach. The next one, we're going to go up from tweenies to toddlers. So we're going to see the same teacher. Some of you will have seen this one actually is also in the Autism for Teachers program. Um, and it's another carefully choreographed uh, interaction between this teacher and these children who are toddlers, remember, they're not preschoolers yet, but she's got quite a varied, kids at quite a different levels of language at the table, one of whom has no language at all. Um, let's watch what she does differently. Teachers can also use visual cues or supports to enhance language development during meal times. Watch how the next teacher uses a picture snack menu to help one girl communicate her choice, while at the same time prompting other children to use their words to indicate their choice. Think about what the children are learning and what else she might do to support expressive language. Let's take a look at our menu. Let's see what we have. Hmm, first thing on our menu is cereal. There's the cereal. It's crunchy. And then next we have so I just want to warn you at the end of this, I'm going to ask you to share what the teacher's doing that is effective in terms of promoting language development, okay? And you'll see it'll be different for each child. Raspberries. They are sweet and juicy. And cheese. Cheese. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get everybody in the bowl. I'll start with a little bit of cereal for everybody so you have something to snack on. Ian, can you give this to Jessica, please? Yeah. Toby, Jessica.
just one. Okay, Vivian, what would you like? Berries or cheese? Berries. Can you plant your berries? You can do few berries. And so you can poke them if you want. Oh, pretty cool. Okay, and what would you like? Berries. I want berries. You want some milk in there? Of course, I can get you some milk in your cereal. Sure thing. A little more cereal? Can you pass me a bowl, please? Then I'll put in more cereal. Here it comes. Crunchy cereal. And here comes some cold milk. A spoon. I thought you might want a spoon. That's a great idea for us. Okay. <laughs> You're helping out your friend. Berries. Sure thing. Oh, cheese too? More berries and more cheese. Okay. Here's more berries. Ready? Can you give them a poke? Some milk. Would you like your milk in a cup or in your bowl of cereal? So you see there, you've got kids that have four or five word language, one that have one or two. Some have none. Okay, I'm going to just show a little bit. This is a long vignette, so when you're leading it, you would be unpacking it at various points in time. But for time, I'm not, I'm not able to do that. But. In your bowl of cereal, okay. Here comes some cold milk in your cereal. Ready? You've got cereal. Oh, cereal, Vivian. You want more cereal. Cereal. There you go. Give you a little spoon. That cereal is pretty crunchy, isn't it? Awesome. Okay. Ian, do you want something to drink? I have water and milk. Milk. No. Okay. Cup of milk for Ian. Jessica, do you want something to drink? A cup of milk? A blue cup? Sure. Here comes a blue cup. Vivian, I see you pointing to some food up there. Is there something you like? I've got more water and cereal. Which one? Cereal. I want cereal. I want cereal. I want cereal. Oh, here it is. There's the cereal, Vivian. Cereal. I'm going to pause it. It goes on, but um, there's a lot, a lot of skill here. Um, so talk to your neighbor now for a minute. What strategies you saw her using to promote language development for each child somewhat differently, right? Okay, we'll give you a minute or so for that. Okay, there's, I'm dying to know what you came up with. I'm so sorry we don't have all day for this, but um, maybe I'll look at the next. Um, did it, you come up with any of these ideas? She was simple, short words, her pace was slow. She described what the child was doing. Did you hear her ask any questions? No questions. She did a lot of waiting. She waited for a response. She combined verbal and nonverbal, right? Lots of imitation, repetition. We'll go away today thinking berries, probably, because we were <laughs> berries, berries, berries. Ba ba ba, getting that berries. Um, there were places where she used the one up rule with a particular child. If children speak in consonants or vowels, we repeat those. You know. So using she used objects with the word, so she paired the word with the actual physical object. In some cases, she's pairing the picture with the object, the physical object, so that the child can know what the picture is. It's a lot there. So you get just compliment yourself for coming up with these ideas. Her use of visual supports, the way she modeled some children to answer, what do you want? the milk or the water, so she prompted verbal language. Um, and I have, oh, I'm going to do puppets, but she, we also use a lot of puppets to enhance language development as well. 
Okay, due to time, I had 11 vignettes to show you, but clearly I'm not going to have time for that. I kind of knew that was going to happen, so I'm kind of, well, you're buzzing, thinking, okay, which ones can I leave out? Um, I'm going to go to puppets, because I'm really, um, I've been using puppets all my life, but or at least <laughs> as long as I can remember. Um, I was using puppets when I was a graduate stu uh, student um, with children, and I'm a big advocate of those. Now, we say, yes, do them in the preschool years because preschool is pre-operational cognitive thinking, and we're, we're really, in, you know, the idea of pretend play and promoting imagination is so big at that age that that's such a powerful way to connect with a child and be intimate with a child when you get in their imaginary world with them. And a lot of people think that doing it with toddlers or babies is too early. But of course, it isn't too early because while they may be still, toddlers are just beginning stages of fantasy pay or pretend play, your puppet can model all these language. So essentially, it's like having another adult next to you modeling, narrating, only with this fun character that you can do it, whether it's a puppet or a, a character sort. Um, from the play activity or almost anything it can be. So in the next vignette, I want you to look at, this is uh, uh, actually the social coaching. So we've moved on from um, programs. One was relationship building, two was language development, three is social coaching. Now each of these programs do have two separate DVDs, one for toddler, tweenies, and one for preschool. It's all in one package, it's not packaged separately. Reason I did that was because a lot of daycare providers do have a wide range of development. And so they don't just have tweenies or toddlers, they also have preschoolers. So I wanted to have that option to have both. So in this one, you're gonna look at what social skills this boy might be learning from Tiny Turtle, who you're familiar with, I'm sure. Um, Using puppets with toddlers can be a powerful way to both model social skills and prompt a toddler's social behavior. Think about what the children are learning from the next teacher's puppet play. Can I help? Yeah. Oh, great. Hmm. I need a block. take a few seconds to tell your buddy what this child is learning from this puppet. Maybe you came up with, at this point, um, I'm going to just comment on a, a few of the things that you can do with a puppet. And if we were a smaller group, we would all practice. But a puppet can do everything that can, you can do. So you know that when you're turkey, working with teachers or parents, you're helping them to know how, what, the, to, what to model, the social skills to model, or to prompt a skill, or praise a child's skill. So, but your puppet can do all those same things that you do as an adult. And so that would involve modeling, the puppet can model feeling language. So, and sometimes parents find it a little easier to do it through the puppet than themselves personally, actually. It's quite interesting to see um, so the puppet can say, I'm having fun playing with you. Now, I sometimes have a hard time getting a parent to say that to a child. I love you. I can play with you. So puppet can model sharing feelings and model friendship skills. So if this was if my puppet, that's not a puppet there, but I can model taking my puppet. I need a hand puppet here. but. Um, taking my puppet and saying, I'm going to be your friend and share my water with you. Yeah? So the puppet can narrate the social activity. And the kids will receive that really well through a puppet. I don't have any research to say that it's better than you doing it yourself and say, I'm going to share my water with you. But somehow or other, the puppet doing these things seems to have a big impact on the children. 
Um, for those of you who've done dinosaur school know that, you know, we do a lot of this thing, these, a whole dinosaur program is done with puppets, so. And um, I don't even think the kids in dinosaur school know I'm an adult anymore. I'm just Wally. <laughs> Actually, I think I lose myself in Wally too. But so describing the feelings, a puppet can describe the feelings or describe the social skill, can narrate it in the way that you're teaching a teacher or a parent to narrate. You can prompt the child to know what he's feeling. You're looking really pensive right now. <laughs> Um, you know, to know what their feeling is at that time. They can, the puppet can model how to ask another child, make a request. So the puppet can say, Lisa, you can ask your friend for that pen. You know, so the puppet can model or prompt the skill that you want them to see or to notice that another child actually said something to them when maybe they missed that altogether. Um, so these puppets can do this both with the social skill or the emotion, whichever unit you're working on, we would be practicing those. Um, so in, we talked a lot in the last, those of you in trainings the last four days, we talked about intentional communication. That is where the teacher lets the child know that another child might need a red block or might need help with something. Puppet can do it too. So the puppet can use intentional communication in that way. Puppet can praise and compliment. There's so much you can do with a puppet in terms of modeling the social emotional. Oh, I'm getting a little finger puppet here already. <laughs> these are great, these little ones too. So oh, puppet, if I wanted to praise you, you worked really hard on that. You know, so they can praise. You stayed really patient. The chairs aren't always comfortable. But how much language, how much language you use depends. So your puppet, sometimes I see them using the puppet has too much language. So it may be, so like we talked about earlier, it may be just the sound effect of the child, depending on what we're working on, or just maybe one word that you're repeating or one upping. Your puppet will do the same thing, right, that we're suggesting. Overextending way too much words can be very complex for kids. Um, too fast for them to digest it. Um, okay, so the amount depends on the child's language level. Keep it simple with your puppet. Don't get overly complex in your puppet play. <laughs> um, lots of repetition. Okay. Don't have to, I'm not going to have time to show this one, but I do want to say this is a big piece of the program is drama play, how to set up your drama units, um, getting into pretend play, um, and encouraging joint play um, is a big piece. Um, for those of you in the autism program, one part of the block play that we saw earlier is in this program as well but not the ongoing part where we're using the visual. Oh, actually, some visual is used. Visual pictures are used throughout, too. Um, even though it's not necessary that you're on the spectrum to use visuals, we recommend using it with any child to enhance language development. Um, OK, um, and the next program four is on emotion coaching. Um, show you just a bit of the teacher reflections on this one. I like taking one of you to Jimmy. Oh. It's a little sad. Bob makes me feel happy. In emotional coaching, we do a lot of, I'm sorry, you're sad. Oh, you're sad. It's our natural, I've learned over the years, I feel like it's our natural inclination to say, you're okay. And these guys don't feel like they're okay. All right, my friends. We are gonna wash hands. Ready to wash? We have sympathy criers. So if one kid is really, really sad, if I don't know how to one start to cry too, I won't even look at a kid. Because sometimes kids are like, they see me and they cry. I, it's too bad, but you know, I'm used to it. I don't take it personally. We like to be outside, I know. And so we do a lot of, Emmadel sat, mom left. She'll be back. Uh-oh, it's Big Bird. 
And we do a lot with happy. Oh, you're happy. You're clapping your hands. You're happy. We're glad you came to school. Oh, yay! Identifying emotions now is pretty young, but kids get it. You know, it's amazing how they'll be able to understand, and they're so empathetic. You know, we try to do a lot of teaching, a lot of empathy. You have lots of stuff there, Nora. Are you okay? You can say, I'm sorry, you're sad, but oh, oh, you know, give your friend a pat. That makes us feel better. Yay! Up until you did it! So motion coaching is, um, it's a big part of what happens in my room um, for all students. All kids at this age, all three, four, and five-year-olds are working on how to um, kind of identify their own emotions and then what to do about them. And we have students who need varying levels of assistance in terms of kind of re-regulating their bodies. When a student is starting to get upset, a common way that we help them kind of calm back down and re-regulate is walking them through taking deep breaths and counting to 10. And we have visual supports for this. Usually I model it first, and so I'll count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then we'll do it together. Let's count to 10, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. Nice job. Can you sit up and count to 10? Oh, nice job. You're sitting up. Put your shoes on. How tiny are you feeling? Oh, tuck them in. Tuck them in. Tuck them in. The turtle, in terms of helping students take a moment when there's an upsetting or frustrating situation, the idea is go in their shell, so to pause and think about what it is that's happening, um, and then when they're ready to think of a solution, to then be able to come out of their shell and use that solution. It's definitely something that we've used for students. What do you think? Which one do you think he did when he was in his shell? He smelled the flower shoe practice. The animal aspect resonates with a number of my students. He's a popular character. From a social emotional perspective, it's a powerful tool because it helps children find a way to pause and then come up with a solution on their own rather than kind of in the moment when emotions are high. Okay, I'm gonna put it right there. We use an emotional regulation thermometer with our large group, like as a whole classroom, and I've done a number of large group um, circles about the thermometer and what it means when your body's in the red, or what it means when your body's in the green or the blue. How's the baby feeling? Is he taking his three breaths? It's a wonderful visual that helps show students kind of how we all have emotions that range from high to low, um, and that that's okay, but helping know what's appropriate to do if your emotions are too high or too low. It shows exactly kind of where students are. I think he's cool, Blue. I'm going to pause it there. But it gives you, showing you that too, not just for the reflections, but to give you some examples of some of the other vignettes that you're not going to see today so you can see how we do this. The cool thing is, too, is you have the parents doing the calm down thermometer or the smell the roses and blow the candle, the same things at home. And they're learning that in the program in terms of a self-regulatory mechanism or they're learning how to use Tiny Turtle to take deep breaths and think of their happy places. Um, you get this cross-setting you know, setting consistency in the language that's being used um, with the children. Um, I think um, there's one more I'm going to just show you maybe a part of. It's hard for me to um, skip over here, but... Um, predictable routines is that this is getting into program five so just so you have an example of that um, and then we the last part is handling misbehavior which we won't get to but if you know we've already done a lot in terms of teaching self-regulation skills which is so important so think here put on your hats again as a group leader and think about what kind of question you would ask teachers um, if um, this, is, this is in regard to setting up a predictable routine. What kind of questions would you ask? I may not show all of this because it's a little bit long, but let's see what we come up with. So your group leader now, thinking about when, when, you, when I pause, what questions you're going to ask. Now all but one of the children are seated and lunch begins. The teacher has given Hayden some time to calm down in a corner of the room with another teacher. Next, think about what makes this teacher's routine for eating together effective. And who's this? Hi, Hayden. Hi, Hayden. We're glad you're here. And Hayden's 
Hayden's here. He's coming over soon. Hi, Hayden. Okay, it's time for our towels. When you get your towel, you're going to squeeze it. One for Vivian. One for you, Forrest. Which one would you like, Jessica? Blue. Here it comes. Boink. How about you, Ian? Yellow. Okay, I'll take the yellow, too. I'll leave this one for Hayden when he comes. I'm going to give it a big squeeze. I take a deep breath. My body is calm and we're ready. We can find our cheeks for a pat, pat, pat. Oh, Forrest knows. Let's count. One, two, three. Pat, pat, pat. Nice. Pat, pat, pat. Lift down. Chin up and down. Oh, I saw my friends doing it. You were doing a pat, pat. Let's give it a big shake. Shake, 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 shake. Watch me, I'm gonna see if I can make it move. Give it a big blow. That's kind of silly. You can make it wave. And down. Oh, cool for us. Now you can put it down on the table. Make it into a square. Very nice. Hayden, I have a towel for you, buddy. Okay, we're gonna do big pats. Wash our table. Here we go. One, two, three. This is the way we wash the table. Wash the table. And if you notice that, that the other table does exactly the same. So this is their routine for washing their hands, washing the table before they get their snack. <laughs> it's become this fantastic um, learning opportunity. So. Take a couple seconds now, talk to your buddy again about what kinds of questions you might ask a teacher showing this. I would have paused it a couple places, but. I'm, okay, just a couple secs. Okay, I hope you came up with some good questions. There can be lots and lots of discussion here. Um, and of course, always with your discussion is what principle you get out from the discussion and then how are they gonna use that principle in their setting, right? So you're not gonna be spending all your time talking about these people, these teachers, they have more resources than we do, all of that, yes, but how are you gonna take that idea and use it in your setting? Key principle, right, of being a group leader is to do that. To take it from, they use this as the trigger for the discussion and take it to their lives. And their, if, they've if they've chosen a target child they're working on to their behavior plan for that child. So you can see that the, the program's got a similar methods and processes that it does TCM or, or parent program. Um, but we're really working here. It's more complex because we're really working here on um, digging deeper into the development of each child, where they are language-wise, where they are play-wise, where they are cognitively, and then adjusting our responses accordingly. Teaching is a hugely complex task. I just, I am constantly and forever amazed by um, teachers um, and how they do this tailoring within their heads with six kids at the same time at the table. Okay, just a sneak preview now. Um, baby program. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't come here to talk about the baby program, but after my discussion yesterday, I couldn't, I couldn't resist last night adding just a little, little thing, more possible motivator, but um, the baby, Incredible Years baby program we try to get the parents, well actually we try to get them during prenatal classes so that they would come in and know each other and come back again after their prenatal classes as soon as possible, ideally four weeks after the baby's born, but we do our recruitment process while they're um, going through prenatal classes. So we're working here a lot. These are some of the topics, how to read the baby signals. Is there anybody here who's done baby? A couple, you have, this table right here. I gotta talk to you some more. Okay, how to read the baby signals, their temperament, um, how to speak to babies. Um, you'll, you'll, 
you know, simplifying the language, lots of singing, how they use the visuals with the babies. Of course, baby proofing their house, big one. Um, but just the idea of helping babies feel secure and loved, um, how to respond to crying. And we do use a different poster of neurons with the baby as well, all the key things we are in terms of the architectural design of the, of the brain, if you will, and, and strengthening those connections we really want to strengthen and not giving perhaps attention to some of the ones or not reinforcing the less effective connections. So I'm gonna just show you a little bit of this uh, as a group that I did for child welfare referred families um, whose babies had been removed. And the babies were, they had to take this uh, course to get their babies back. Um, and it was uh, really difficult for me because the babies would go away after the group. They'd take them back to the foster care. But I did invite the foster parents to stay as well. And that actually turned out to be really beneficial in terms of sort of broadening uh, support systems um, and helping foster parents and parents know how to, how to talk together and share. Oops. Show you a little bit of it. I loved it actually. <laughs> I still loved it too. It was different, a different experience, but I was kind of excited still to come and learn more things and. Um, get more, a little bit more parenting tools and skills. Who starts crying? Less to her dad. Really learned a lot. He's because he's a first time parent, so I think he's gotten a lot out of the class. I think we got an alert principal. It could be, it could be a distress call. Okay, so you want to check out and make sure the baby's safe. Yeah. Yes, that's excellent. a great principal. Very good. We're both learning together. Before he'd get like a little frustrated because he didn't know too much about babies. Now he's learned a lot more stuff. He's not getting so frustrated as he was before. And then who did their buddy calls? His buddy calls helped a lot. Yeah, because we're going through the same thing we are. We get to share with each other what's going on with our babies and how we're dealing with new things. Is it a little boy? Is it a little boy? I interact more with her. I do a lot more things with her. I definitely read a lot more with her. I want her to learn a lot and being here I learned how to show her more things so she can learn. I love talking to her and um, I read the book and I make sure I say the numbers and the words. Oh, look at the bear again. See the bear? Itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. About the singing. She loves when I sing itsy bitsy spider. Out came the sun and 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 the Pause it there. Makes me want to cry watching this girl. Um, they got their babies back, they're doing well. Um, they all signed up for the um, toddler program. So they're, it, they're, there's an interview where they talk about, this is our support group. <laughs> and they came back and um, continued on. Um, okay, I'll stop there. Okay, I'm kind of going to shift gears. That gives you some sampling of what Incredible Beginnings is about and what the baby program is about. Now I'm going to do an overview with giving feedback about um, how you're doing relative to some other countries in terms of different programs. Um, here, just where programs are being delivered, it seems to me, my understanding, um, lots of places in, in New Zealand, I mean, we are finding them in community centers. Sometimes even um, companies are offering it to their employees. Um, Walmart, for example, is offering a parenting program for their employees. That's kind of cool to see. Homeless shelters, um, home visits. Um, so I have all of the programs, baby, toddler, and preschool, all have a home coaching model attached to them. 
Um, does anybody know Dean? He asked this question yesterday. Is anybody here that was with Dean yesterday? Could you give him that feedback? Because he asked that question, and I realized in the middle of the night I didn't answer it. Um, yes, home coaching for some of these families for our child welfare ones, like the ones you saw there, we would combine home coaching with, with the group. So we could have some. With the baby program, they have the babies there for them. But for, for example, preschool, um, we want to do some practices with the parents, with the kids. So we do that in the home coaching model, and there is a training for that. I don't think we've ever done that training here. Um, there's a protocol for that. A uh, number of countries are doing the program in jails for incarcerated parents, um, doing practices there and doing the, the program. Holland has a really two very nice published papers on how they've used this for incarcerated parents. And they follow up once they come home with follow through afterwards. Doctor's offices are in other places that we're seeing the program being used. We're in over 19 countries now around the world. Um, I've spent some time now in, in uh, West Bank. Um, they have a fantastic program there where they've combined teacher, parent, child program in the school. That's some of the pictures you see over here. That's a group of parents that um, I did a group with there. This was uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in New Zealand. <laughs> um, the group that we were working on, the teacher, um, just so you can see the picture in advance. I'm sorry I didn't have my, my picture from my group yesterday, but I hopefully, maybe I'll have it by this afternoon. Okay, so where are we here in terms of combined parent, teacher, and child programs? Um, you've done almost close to 3,000 uh, people have been trained, teachers or parents. That's now this is from the this this is data over the span of which I have known you and collected data. So <clears throat> that we have is registered having registered for taking a training with us. What? You don't what? You think we're higher than that. Well, that's all you've given us the data on. <laughs> You're supposed to collect that data every time you do a workshop and submit it to us. <laughs> so otherwise, if we don't have it, you don't, you don't get accredited either. <laughs> it's their documentation that it's been done. So in terms of the parent program, looking at here, um, 1,784 um, group leaders trained in the parent program. And, you know, I mean, New Zealand is four and a half million, right? Something like that, four and a half to five. Um, so th these numbers are kind of misleading because while, while United States might have 13,000, you know, it's a much bigger population. So the, the proportions to the population are kind of misleading. But it does give you some ideas of where else the programs have been um, taken up. Some of the other sizes that are similar to use would be Norway and Denmark that are around similar size population. Okay, here's the child program. Um, the US has really taken that one on board more than New Zealand is small <coughs> here. Um, Ireland's another country that's done more with it and Norway. And they did a study with the child program as well. Aha, here's what the one I showed you earlier, what a job you're doing with the teacher program relative to other countries, you're the best. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Baby program, just shows you some other countries where we are with that. New Zealand, it's got 50 people trained. I've got um, ASD, um, this, this is, um, trained in the ASD program is what I've got. Um, we can check and see if this is accurate. I'm just wondering if it is. But anyway, we, what we're finding is 59 in autism and 60 in autism teacher. So it's about 50-50 for the teacher versus the parent, which is nice. OK, I looked at the percentage of those trained in New Zealand to the percentage accredited. So it's somewhere from 10 to 
Um, you know, sometimes people come for training that don't decide it isn't the program for them or they're there as admin people or support people and they don't intend to deliver. Um, uh, so, it, you know, it's hard to know with these figures how many of that's the case. Um, I would like to see our, the, the numbers go up in terms of the percentage that get accredited, but I do, in true confidence, to do, want you to know that you actually do better than most. So the, the resistance to accreditation is fairly high. And it's kind of surprising because we do have data ourselves. We did data on that. And we know that the fidelity of program delivery and the outcomes are better for accredited leaders. So what's exciting to me is about the government support for trying to support people to get accredited. Um, so I'm expecting I'm going to see these numbers come up. I mean, how many people have told me they're sending me tapes while I've been here? <laughs> now, whether they will, hopefully they will. I didn't write down their names. But <laughs> um, so here's peer coaching certification accreditation. So you have 59 peer coaches here. Do you see any country that looks anything like that? No. So that's why I think that your accreditations percentages should go up, because if you're getting good coaching, should happen, right? Yeah. That's, that's really awesome. Mentors, New Zealand has nine mentors. Gives you a comparison to some of the other countries. Mentor meeting in Seattle. Mentors meant last year in Seattle, so I was gonna ask you on this picture, identify the seven New Zealanders. <laughs> they are there, that's your task, right? And finally, um, I cannot tell you, I have to pinch myself and tell myself I'm not really having a dream right now. Um, I really think that, this, that New Zealand is doing an amazing thing, amazing, uh, great work to see the progress that's been done. And I thank the New Zealander mentors and coaches and group leaders for everything that you've done, um, for the support that you've gotten from the Ministry of Education, from Wary Center, from Massey. It's really awesome. Um, so pat yourselves on the back for that. These are your uh, mentors here, the pictures that you see. Where are you all? Put your hands up. Assuming you all know each other, but if you don't, make sure you be sure you uh, talk to them. Um, so we do know both from the research um, that we have an opportunity here to make a difference. We know that from there's so many randomized controlled trials now, we know that we can change behavior. We know that we can affect language development and brain development. Um, really, why parents and teachers working together in the way that you're doing here, we can make a huge difference to the outcomes. And we know the risks if we don't. We pay for it in a lot of different ways in the long run. So I thank you. I am honored um, that you've taken this on board. I hope that you're having fun doing it at the same time. And for me, there's a reason I've been doing this for as many years as I've been doing. It brings me more joy than anything else to have this intimacy, this closeness with these teachers and these families and see them just blossom and fall in love with these students and kids over and over again. And you as group leaders have undoubtedly experienced that yourselves. It's, it's a privilege to be able to be in the lives of these families and these teachers. So thank you for your investment in this. And I look forward to talking to you and hearing more today and about what you're doing. Um, I think we're gonna have a break now or something. Thank you.
Papa. Merci.